again everyone and welcome to our next lecture on our Civil War lectures and we have talked about several things the growing sectionalism the Missouri Compromise uh, the nullification crisis the arguments over tariffs um, but now we're going to talk about one of the biggest catalysts of the Civil War and that was the impact of the Mexican-American War um, and it only heightened the opposing viewpoints that led to this divisive sectionalism in the country uh, the, the, you know, the result of the Mexican-American War opened up new lands as a part of that Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The United States acquired new lands for American settlers. And of course, with the new lands and the new territory, once again, raised the divisive issue of whether slavery was going to be allowed to spread in the new territories. Um, now, Southerners, as a part of the debate over new Western territories, were already demanding new laws to help them retrieve um, African-American slaves who escaped into any new territory. Anyway, so President Polk, um, who was a Southern Democrat and a slave owner himself, believed that you know the slavery question in the territory was kind of an abstract question. He didn't believe that most of the Southwest was really fit to you know for agricultural slavery because of the really dry climate there. But um, an angry debate and Congress broke out anyway, um, and he, it didn't take long for President Polk to realize the issue of slavery in the territory was not something that he could brush aside. Um, but nonetheless, there were plenty of Southerners who pointed out the fact that there were plenty of areas in the Southwest and in the Western territories where slavery had already existed, uh, in the mines in California, and there were areas in New Mexico to where certain varieties of cotton could be planted. So in August of 1846, Representative David Wilmot, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, he proposed um, an addition to the War Appropriations Bill to go to the War with Mexico. And he proclaimed that any territory gained uh, from Mexico uh, should ban slavery. Before the, This was before the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo or anything like that was even being negotiated. This was at the outbreak of the war. He's already getting ahead of the problem. Now, Wilmot, he was a group, uh, he was from a group of Northern Democrats who believed the president was pro-Southern. Uh, and Polk had supported a new tariff that helped the South, kind of at the expense of nor Northern manufacturers. And he compromised with the British uh, on a Northern boundary at Oregon, uh, where slavery was likely to be banned anyway. But he decides to go to war for Mexico because he thinks that there's an opportunity for slavery to extend, expand there. Uh, so a lot of people in the North... Um, began to sense a slave power conspiracy here. But Wilmot's pr proposal absolutely angered uh, Southerners. Uh, they thought that any anti-slavery decision about the territory would threaten slavery everywhere. Uh, despite fierce Southern opposition, however, a coalition of Northern Democrats and Whigs, uh, they decided to pass the Wil Wilmot Proviso in the ha House of Representatives. Uh, the Senate, um, ha however, uh, decided to reject it. But during the debate over what's going to become of the new territory gained from the Mexican-American War, uh, Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, although he was weak from tuberculosis and toward the end of his life, he prepared a series of resolutions to counter the Wilmot Proviso. Now, the Calhoun resolutions, like the Wilmot Proviso, uh, which, I mean, the Calhoun resolutions didn't even go as far as the Wilmot Proviso. Uh, Calhoun's resolutions didn't even come to a vote. Uh, moderates in the Senate were, able, were unwilling to consider them, but they demonstrated something. The Wilmot Proviso and Calhoun's resolutions, they demonstrated the growing anger of many Southerners, but they also began to display that even within the two parties themselves, uh, the Whig Party uh, and the Democratic Party, that you had people from the North and the South in the different parties who were splitting from within. Anyway, um, but Calhoun did warn also that if they tried to ban slavery in the new territories, uh, that a civil war would surely erupt, and that was, you know, didn't take too much wisdom to figure that out. The Wilmot Proviso stirred passions on both sides in Congress, as we mentioned. Uh, the issue of slavery's expansion um, divided the country across sectional lines uh, once again. Uh, north and South, many moderates um, were kind of looking for a, a solution that would kind of throw fire, or excuse me, throw water on this um, fire that's being created over this new territory. So Senator Lewis Cass of Michigan proposed a solution. 
He just simply suggested that the citizens of each new territory uh, would be allowed to decide for themselves if they wanted to permit slavery or not. And this became what became known as popular sovereignty. So rather than having Congress you know, do anything, um, just let the people in those territories decide for themselves. Now, it doesn't say how they go, go about doing it, and we'll see that in the Kansas-Nebraska situation, you'll see that the way that some territories decided whether or not slavery was going to go there uh, was through armed conflict and bloodshed. Popular sovereignty appealed uh, to many members of Congress because it kind of took the slave issue kind of off their plate. It also appeared that Democrats, excuse me, it also appeared uh, somewhat democratic since the settlers themselves could make the decision. But abolitionists argued that it still denied African Americans the right not to be enslaved. But many Northerners, especially in the Midwest, supported the idea because they thought Northern settlers would occupy most of the new territory and would ban slavery from their states. Um, but here's the issue with popular sovereignty, and we're going to see it coming up in the future. Some of those territories are above the Missouri Compromise Line. So that would kind of nullify the Missouri Compromise from 1820, and it would also suggest that Congress wouldn't have a say on whether or not slavery would be in a, in a new state. That would be kind of giving up a lot of power from Congress. Anyway, but a new political party was emerging. Since we're starting to see not only a split north and south, we're starting to see the Democrat Party split and the Whig Party split within themselves. With the 1848 election approaching, uh, the Whigs decided to choose Zachary Taylor, the hero of the war with Mexico, to run for president um, in the Whig Party. Um, as we said before, the Whig Party was split. Many northern Whigs, as some people call them conscious Whigs, opposed slavery. They also opposed Taylor because they believed he wanted to expand slavery westward because he actually owned slaves in the cotton plantation. He's going to surprise them, though. Uh, Anyway, so they became known as the Conscious Whigs, but there were other Whigs known as Cotton Whigs because many of them were linked to northern textile manufacturers who needed southern cotton. So they were a little bit more uh, sympathetic to slave owning, obviously, and the keen cotton in the South. So Conscious Whigs opposed slavery, opposed Zachary Taylor, Cotton Whigs. They were kind of sympathetic to the South because most of them were textile manufacturers in the North and they wanted some more of that cheap cotton from the South. Anyway, uh, the decision to nominate Taylor anyway just made a lot of conscious Whigs wanted to quit the party. So they joined with anti-slavery Democrats from New York who were frustrated that their party had nominated Lewis Cass instead of Martin Van Buren. Um, obviously, Lewis Cass was kind of opened the door for slavery in the new territories with popular sovereignty. So the two groups, the Northern Van Buren Democrats or the Barn Burners and Northern Conscious Whigs, they joined and created what was called the Liberty Party, or excuse me, the Free Soil Party. Um, now, other there were other people who joined the Liberty Party as well. I mean, excuse me, the Free Soil Party. Um, former Free uh, Liberty Party members um, from uh, the early from the 1840s party that broke out, Abolitionist Party, decided to link up with the Free Soil Party, uh, and also uh, just other abolitionists in general who wanted to oppose slavery. So the Free Soil Party was kind of a blend of a lot of people. You had some Whigs, you had some Northern Democrats, you had some fierce abolitionists, you had some moderates who just wanted to stop the expansion of slavery, you had people who wanted to end slavery altogether. Uh, so you, it was kind of a, a, a unique blend. There were so many different factions, they really couldn't get on really much of anything significant. Um, anyway, the Free Soil Party, they, they, they had a little campaign slogan in 1848 it was pretty catchy uh, free soil free speech free labor and free men uh, but that would be your free soil party that split up the Whigs uh, and the Democratic Party anyway in the 1848 election uh, candidates from the, all three parties campaigned and obviously trying to win this election uh, Democrats selected Lewis Cass of Michigan uh, even though his popular sovereignty attracted some moderates the people in the South didn't approve of his popular sovereignty. They just simply liked the fact that he at least didn't deny that you know slavery could move into new territories. Um, again, Martin Van Buren, uh, he led the Free Soil Party. 
which is an interesting pick because he used to be a kind of a slave power Democrat. Uh, he just opposed uh, moving slavery into the new territories. And, of course, Zachary Taylor was the Whig candidate. And he didn't really have a platform. The, nobody really knew what the Whigs were all about. And it actually worked out for him because um, the Whigs and Zachary Taylor ended up winning the election of 1848. And a lot of people in the South gave their um, support to Zachary Taylor instead of Lewis Cass because, well, they didn't really know anything about him other than he did have cotton. He did have plantations in the South, and he was a slave owner, and he was a war hero. And a lot of people in the South fought in the Mexican-American War, and they thought, well, surely Zachary Taylor is going to let us take our slaves into the West. But that's not going to be the case. But regardless of all this, we're seeing the significance here. Let's backtrack. The Mexican-American War opened up new land for the United States. Now, the, the future of these territories and the new states obviously is going to split people because, of course, people who don't want to see slavery expand, mainly northern conscious Whigs, uh, anti-slavery Democrats, and um, abolitionists are not going to want to see slavery there. And, of course, we want to try to keep that balance in Congress between slave and free states. Of course, Southerners believe their slaves are their property and that there's nothing that can stop them from taking their slaves into the new territories. Um, so this kind of just explodes the problem again. That's kind of, you know, we've always kind of been able to kick the can down the road regarding slavery. But now all of a sudden, boom, we got a bunch of new land and the question of slavery is going to be hot again. And, of course, the Wilmot Proviso and John C. Calhoun's resolutions just simply, you know, helped reignite that issue. And this 1848 election also sees party lines being split, not just Whigs versus Democrats. Now you have Whigs fighting against Whigs and some Whigs leaving the Whig Party and some Democrats leaving the Democratic Party to create this so-called Free Soil Party. So we're just split all kinds of ways now. I mean, the country split, the parties are split. And obviously, the, the question of slavery can't go unresolved for much longer. Um, but nonetheless, the Mexican-American War had a tremendous impact on the upcoming crisis.